In the mid-90s, Batman was big again and Warner Brothers wanted to strike while people were still humming Kiss from a Rose. Okay, so they needed a new Batman, which was no problem at all. You could just order one up from the Batman catalog. Batman and Robin. Tim Burton's Batman starring Michael Keaton had been a huge success when it was released in 1989. The follow-up was a darker film, less Batman, more Tim Burton, and while it did well, it left a weird taste in the mouths of some viewers, like drinking cranberry juice straight after brushing your teeth. Director Joel Schumacher took over the reins of the third Batman film, Batman Forever, with a new Batman that also introduced Batman's sidekick, Robin. Batman Forever, whilst being a loud, silly and ultimately ordinary popcorn movie, did reinvigorate the franchise. Schumacher got to work on a follow-up to be released in 1997, but he would also have to look for a new Batman since Val Kilmer was away visiting relatives on one of the moons orbiting Jupiter. Batman is no more. You can't just quit him. In Batman and Robin, Mr. Freeze is on a quest to collect a big ass diamond in order to find a cure for his ill wife, who he has stored in a giant soda stream while he researches a cure for her condition. He also has a constant supply of sparkling water. One more giant diamond of this size, and my freezing engine will be complete. <laughs> Also, since this is a superhero film, there needs to be two villains. A scientist is turned into a botanically minded villain going by the moniker Poison Ivy. Because it's not nice to fool with Mother Nature. She has a thing about deforestation or something, and so she has teamed up with Freeze to, oh, I don't know, kill people. Ivy also has a henchman tag along, a big brute named Bane. Ivy is able to control men's minds with a pheromone, though with that costume I'm not entirely convinced that's totally necessary. Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson have caught whiff of her secretions, oh come on now, and begin sniping at each other like two elderly men arguing over who the teenage checkout chick at Target was actually smiling at. You two boys aren't gonna start fighting over little old me now, are you? Meanwhile, Alfred is sick, conveniently afflicted by the same illness that struck down Freezer's wife. His niece, Barbara Wilson, visits, ostensibly to take Alfred away from his life of servitude. But somewhere along the line, she decides to help out. In which case, Alfred, the leery old goat, has already designed a perfectly form-fitting costume that perfectly fits his niece's figure. He took the liberty to create something in your size. Which is not remotely creepy. And thus, Batgirl is born. Bruce, it's me, Barbara. I found the Batcave. We gotta get those locks changed. She knows who we are. Guess we'll just have to kill her. Yep, we'll kill her later, we have work to do. Freeze and Ivy's partnership quickly falls apart, like a marriage between an actress and a rock star. Freeze relents after discovering he's been betrayed by Ivy, and for a change, Batman doesn't kill the villains off, and instead allows Freeze to continue his research into curing his ice block, I mean his wife, in return for curing Alfred. And I've come to make your life a living hell. Batman and Robin has problems in a few areas, but chiefly the main problem is that it's not in any way a good film. You dick. The action sequences seem loud and flashy, but the fight choreography and editing is a bit sluggish, like a sloth that's just woken up and the coffee machine is broken. On many of these films, set pieces are put together first and a story is created to stitch the big action set pieces together. It's not an altogether terrible way to put together an action film, but when done poorly, it results in less than a brilliant movie. Hi, Freeze. I'm Batman. George Clooney was a big TV star at the time, but his first few feature films did not do all that well. As Batman and Bruce Wayne, he's fine. Great stems, though. Buds, too. Yeah, those are nice. Way better than Kilmer in the previous film, but a half-decent Batman in a terrible film isn't going to distract people from the fact it's a terrible film. You know, Dick, sometimes counting on somebody else is the only way to win. Chris O'Donnell is back as Robin, and he's still one of the few people to pitch their character properly. This is no partnership. You're never gonna trust me! Uma Thurman as Ivy has caught a case of Tommy Lee foolery, going full pantomime evil stepsister in order to make an almost but not quite unwatchable film into an almost but not quite watchable one. Enough monkey business. We've got work to do. <sighs> monkey work! We do at least learn which is Poison Ivy's favourite Bon Jovi album. How about Slippery When Wet? Arnold Schwarzenegger seems to be a reasonably good fit for Mr Freeze. Let's kick some ice. 
He lands the terrible puns, but they aren't amusing enough to overcome the film's boat anchor of the script, weighing everything down like an elephant applying chest compressions. Michael Goff is back as Alfred. It's Michael Goff, it's Michael Goff, it's Michael, 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 Michael Goff. And he's now given a little more story to sink his teeth into. Unfortunately, it's this film he sunk his teeth into, so I hope Goff sought medical advice for that metallic aftertaste. I'll cancel the pizza. Alicia Silverstone, remember her. No, seriously, you remember Alicia Silverstone. Remember her. Clueless, and all those other football, you know, Clueless. And you are? That girl. She's okay in this film. In fact, the cast are mostly okay and adequate, but the film is too okay and rarely better than adequate. It's really ridiculous. If all of the films in the Burton Schumacher franchise were parachutes, Batman and Robin would be a pocket umbrella. I want to make sure you're serious about turning over a new leaf. Batman and Robin had less preparation time than previous films, and that may have contributed to it feeling less well thought out in places. But then they had time on the previous film, and that wasn't all that amazing either. I hate when people talk during the movie. By 1997, filmmakers were starting to feel a little more confident in the use of computer-generated special effects, and Batman and Robin uses them for a lot of things, like freezes, icy guns, but there's also some early use of digital doubles. They're generally not terrible effects for the time. Well, there are far more things about this film that stand out as not being great than the special effects. Batman and Robin is also the most toyetic of the films. Toyetic is a word used to describe media that has lots of opportunities for toys. I mean, a film like Goodwill Hunting isn't a film that's an obvious candidate for toys, nor would My Best Friend's Wedding. But Batman and Robin, with each character having more costume changes than a marathon swimmer with a gastrointestinal bug. A laundry service that delivers! Wow! Toy companies would get advanced looks at designs for characters and vehicles early on in the process, so that they would have enough time to have toys ready for release at the same time as the film. Even Joel Schumacher would later say the influence of toy companies was too prevalent in the filmmaking process, but also admits he was a willing participant at the time. Batman and Robin is a great toy commercial, but a lacking film. But if you are in the mood for a two hour toy commercial, then Schumacher has got your back. Okay, it's a less than brilliant movie, and I'd also have to go with less than decent. But of the four 80s, 90s Batman films, this was by far the hardest to get through and stay awake. It's a chore and a struggle to watch. Audiences felt similarly, with the film attracting withering reviews and generally poor box office receipts. It's almost as if making an expensive and terrible film over and over just to sell toys wasn't a great idea. It's Batman and Robin, not Robin and Batman, and I'm sick of it. Schumacher had ideas for a fourth film that would have involved Scarecrow, but Batman and Robin's poor reception saw Warner Brothers putting the franchise on ice, <laughs> with the character rebooted by Christopher Nolan's 2005 film, Batman Begins. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos.